even if we only threw a couple of counsels, I hope what was apparent, and this is what I was really trying to emphasize in that class, in that lesson, um, is that the church's faith does not develop, right? Obviously, with the councils, we begin to develop different um, human language to express the faith, but it's always in response to those who are objecting to core tenets of the faith from the apostles, right? Okay, with Arius, for example, Arius is saying Jesus Christ is not God. Well, so we have to develop language to, to defend the fact that, Jesus, that Christ is God, right? Because we always believed, right? The Second Council is a, is a you know, that part too, as well as the nature of the, you know, the reality that the Holy Spirit is also God. Right? God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What does that mean? Um, the Third Council, the Fourth Council, the Fifth Council, the Sixth Council, all deal with use, developing language to affirm the reality that Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man, but in one person. He's not a human being and a divine being conjoined in some way. He is a divine being who has taken on our humanity. He has become fully human, and for that reason we can call him a human being. But it's not that he's a human being plus a divine being combined. He is a divine being, the second person of the Trinity, who has taken on the fullness of what we are. The uncreated God has taken on the nature of his creation. And in and through him, therefore, there's a bridge of sorts between creation and the uncreated. Right? And by and in Christ, we are restored to union with God, or at least potentially restored. The seventh council, which we celebrated last Sunday, right, uh, in, the, in a brief summary, right, affirms the church's ancient use of icons, right, as a testament to the reality of the incarnation. Why is it so important? Well, because if you reject icons, if you destroy your content, it's, a, it's essentially rejecting the reality of the incarnation. God has become man. And because of that, we can depict him as man. Right? And he's restored the image of God in humanity in his own person. And therefore, those in his image are like, you know, it's kissing an image of an image. Does that make any sense, right? Um, on that note, something I didn't cover on Friday and I haven't covered in general, but. I've noticed a lot of people recently, some of our new members, I'm going to find a subtle way to tell some of the new converts and don't be this way. Um, when they come up for communion, they've been kissing the icons, uh, like the icon in the center on the tetrapod. Um, we don't do that. And it's not that it's like wrong, but why wouldn't we do that? Well, before us in Holy Communion, we have Christ himself. It'd be like, um, you know, if, if my mother were in town, Instead of going up and embracing her and, and you know giving her a big hug because I see my mother, instead I, uh, I walk over to, to a picture of her on the wall and I kiss that instead. Yeah. It's not that it's like wrong, it just it shows a lack of understanding of what's going on here. That's specifically for communion. Not yeah, because because Christ himself is in our midst. Why would you kiss an icon? Yeah. You know, what, again, not, not when you're walking in. Yes. That yes. You still want to kiss yes. Him. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But it's I've noticed, and I, and I and it's never a time I can say something because here I'm giving communion. And there's people coming up and they're kissing the, the icon there in the center before they, you know, which is born out of piety. It's not, but it shows, it shows a, a lack of understanding, right? Again, it's like, why would you kiss a picture of someone when that person is actually there in front of you? So it's, it's, it just needs to be taught, right? And it's not, it's not to condemn anyone. Um, so tonight, though, we're going we're gonna to go over the Great Schism to understand how it was that the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church became two separate churches. Um, importantly, um, that convention of calling what we are the Orthodox Church, God bless you, Sid. <laughs> yeah, do you have a nebulizer yeah. on them? Yeah. Okay. I, I, I have a nebulizer out in the car if he needs it with okay. all of his meds. Okay. So. Um, He's got a cold yeah, on top of it. Yeah, that adds to it. But, um, yeah, so, you know, by convention, we now call well, our church the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church, the, you know, the Roman Catholic Church, they call themselves the Catholic Church. But the reality is that both of us claim to be the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, the Catholic Church, and both of us claim to have the Orthodox faith, the faith of the apostles, right? Um, but in the modern era, when, you know, mass communication became more of a thing or, you know, worldwide communication became more of a thing, with the advent of things like global trade and what have you, it became untenable for both groups to call themselves the Catholic Church and the Orthodox faith. And so we're not quite sure how this happened, but in the 16th and 17th centuries, starting in the 16th and it became just normative by the 17th to so the 1500s to the 1600s, 
the distinction between you know we call ourselves the Orthodox Church but believe we're the Catholic Church and they call themselves the Catholic Church but believe that they're the Orthodox Church developed does that make any sense so before then you find actually that both are calling themselves both the you know the Orthodox and the Catholics like it's, it's they're in, you know they're, they're essentially synonymous terms although different because Orthodoxy refers to the faith of the church and Catholic refers to the nature of it being the one fully Catholic and apostolic church but um, so before then but nowadays of course we have two distinct churches how did that happen right so um, this is mostly I mean we're going to go over this and I hope what I'm going to reveal through all of this is that it really is less about dogmatic issues and more about the question of the the Pope's position in the church although that is tied up with issues surrounding the addition that the, that the Roman Catholics add to the creed of the filioque. So we say, right, I believe, in, and in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. And they added one word in Latin, which is three words in English, uh, and the Son. So they say, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, right? Again, it's one word in Latin called filioque, so the whole thing is called the filioque, or the filioque clause, or the filioque but um, so let's go. But where does where does this come from? Where does this addition come from? Well, the first time we see it appearing is in southern Gaul, like around the city of Narbonne in uh, on, on the on the French Riviera down down south there, um, in the fifth century, so the four hundreds, um, against the Arianism to use to use against the Arianism of the ruling Visigoths. So if you don't know, the Visigoths ruled over what is today Spain, Portugal, and uh, and southern France. Right? They were they were Goths. Who Visigoth means Western Goths because some of them, the Ostrogoths, conquered Italy, um, and the Visigoths conquered uh, conquered Spain and southern Gaul. And um, the Visigoths had been evangelized by an Arian bishop, um, and so they actually were uh, were were thoroughly Arian. And so the faithful there, the vast majority of the of the essentially the peasantry, were Orthodox in their faith, part of the Catholic Church, um, but. The, the ruling elites were all Aryan heretics. And so obviously that was creating issues from the time they got uh, arrived and took over. And um, the reason yeah, why- Arian refers to what here? Um, Arius was a priest, and we, we talked about this last week, sorry. Uh, was a priest in Alexandria who taught that, that the Son and Word of God, who of course takes on flesh as Jesus Christ, was a creature. He was the first and most exalted of all creatures. He's the most godlike of all creatures, but he is a creature. Okay. And just to briefly, again, you weren't here last week, so, and you can eventually watch it, but to briefly cover that, he's applying essentially Aristotelian logic to the revelation of God. Rather than accepting the revelation of God as is, he's trying to make it work within his own logical system. Mm -hmm. And something that we the, talked about this one. Yeah, essentially, yeah. and we agree with this, I mean, the, the Hebrew system, the scriptures are this way as well. There's a radical distinction, as in uh, the uncreated God is totally transcendent. He's totally beyond his creation, right? Um, and so Arius' argument is, well, if Christ is going to save us, he must be a creature as well, because how else could he unite himself to us, right? So he argues that, that, that Christ is not co-eternal, co-pre-eternal, meaning together before time, with, um, before the ages with God the Father. Instead, he is a creature, right? Um, and so the, the, the Orthodox, the Catholics, however you want to describe them, in Southern Gaul, originally, again in the fifth century, begin to insert this into the creed as a way to um, essentially bolster the divinity of the Son against Arianism. And this is based on really bad theology too, but um, it's because to a certain extent they accepted the thinking of Arius um, and so one of the major Arian teachers that we covered briefly last week was Eunomius, and he argued that, I'm, gonna, I'm hoping Daniel wouldn't have erased my, uh, my diagrams from last, from uh, Friday, but he said he put a smile at him. Yeah, well, I'm smiling back at him with my heart <laughs> as I erase his smile at him. Um, let's see here. So the, the, the church's essentially understanding of the internal working of the Trinity, and it's not based on human reason, it's based on revelation, right? Because you have God, our God and Father, right? So you have the Father, who is unbegotten, and let's just translate it as unsent, 
but he's not sent forth. Um, and then he is the monarch. He is the first principle of the Trinity. Right? He is God, full stop. But he eternally, before time, before he, they're, they're not created, part of his existence, right, is he eternally begets or generates, gives birth to the Son, who is therefore begotten, but he's of course unsent. And the scriptures tell us that the Father eternally sends forth, right, uh, pours forth the Holy Spirit, who is therefore sent, but also unbegotten. And uh, this is what the scriptures teach us, right? St. Gregory the Theologian, the, uh, the famed uh, uh, Archbishop of Constantinople and, and Cappadocian thinker, uh, responds to the question of well, what is the difference between being begotten, oh sorry, and sent forth, right? What is the difference? We have no idea. This is conveying things that are internal to God, who is of course beyond the mind's ability to comprehend. But this is what's revealed to us, that somehow the way that the Son has his co-pre-eternal being, right? So again, co-pre-eternal, right? So before there's even a time to be outside of, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are before that, they exist before that, and are equally so, right? So co-pre-eternally, the Son is begotten of the Father, and the Holy Spirit is sent, because what the scriptures teach us, what is the difference between the two? We have no idea. Right? This is actually beyond our ability to comprehend. This is just the scriptural model. Right? So we accept what God has revealed through human language to us. What does this mean? We don't know. We don't try to address that. Because again, this is all talking about God in and of himself, which is God in his own nature, which is beyond the mind's ability to comprehend. Because the creature cannot comprehend the, the one who is uncreated, the creator. Right? Um, but this is the biblical model. Well, the problem is, is that Eunomius, who was an Arian, I'll write that out, who was, uh, was a, a later stage Arian, so Arius, sorry, so Arius, he's not exactly a disciple, but he is an Arian. Eunomius says that, um, he actually argues that we can understand the God in himself, because we can understand these, um, these attributes simply as, well, even if we don't understand everything about God, we can understand that by that God as God is unbegotten and unsent. And therefore, someone who, if, if the Son is begotten, he is not God. And likewise, if the Holy Spirit is not sent, if he's sent forth, then he's likewise not God. Um, well, the Filioque attempts to address this by creating a, a different model for uh, for the Trinity. Oh, let me say also, um, let's do this. This is God in and of himself. This is what we, we call the, uh, the, the hypostatic, meaning the personal, the tri-hypostatic, tri let's just say, uh, existence of God, but his energetic existence, meaning how he actually operates um, in the world, right? Ener energy, which we didn't cover today because my sermon got derailed by Think more important things to address. Um, the energies of God, I mean God's activity, God's operation in the world, right? So his energetic existence, as we perceive it, right, is that you have all divine activity is one. There's not, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit do not operate separately. It's one of the what makes them one God versus we all are humans, but we're distinct beings, right? Because we operate independently. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit do not operate independently. Whenever they act, in the world, because the we, we can only perceive their action, right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit, right? Um, all divine action, right? I, if this is the, uh, that's not how you spell world. Sorry. Um, so uh, all divine action is from the Father through the Son and in the Holy Spirit, right? That's how the divine action works, energetically. Um, and this is somewhat complicated. I'm trying to make this as simple as possible. Um, but the, the filioque attempts to 
bolster the divinity of the son against the Arians, who are primarily concerned in saying that the son is not God, right? That's their primary argument. Um, they don't seem to be too concerned about the Holy Spirit, partially because in their mind, if the Son is not God, then certainly the Holy Spirit isn't either, right? So their primary argument is against the Son. So to bolster the Trinity against this, essentially they create a new model for the Trinity, which which actually uh, kind of combines the two, the hypostatic, the trihypostatic existence of God in and of Himself, and His energetic existence, how He operates in the world, where you have the Father and the Son, right? The Father begets the Son, but the Son is equally divine with the Father because they both send forth, send, the Holy Spirit, who then operates in the world. Um, and... Uh, of course, you might ask, well, what about the Holy Spirit? How is he not equal? This is one of the arguments that the Orthodox have against the Filioque. Because if you're going to say that 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 sending forth the Holy Spirit is what makes Father and the Son equally God, then how is the Holy Spirit equally God? Right? And this is issues, but we're not going to get into all the details of this, right? My point is, is that essentially the Filioque pushes the Son onto the same level of the Father by saying that they together, as if, uh, well, okay, it's actually not a good model. Well, the, the Orthodox teaching is still that they, they're equally divine, the Father and Son, but the, the Father is like the monarch of the Trinity. Yes, it's called, it, it's, yes. It's a, it's, he is the monarch. He is the, he's the first principle of the Trinity. But they're equally divine. But they're equally divine yeah. because he, part of being the monarch of the Trinity is that he co-pre-eternally begets the Son, and co-pre-eternally, meaning they're all equally uncreated, yeah. right? So even though he's the first principle, and it's his will that is the will of God, and it is his nature that is the nature of God that is shared completely co-pre-eternally by means of his begetting, his co-pre-eternal begetting of the Son and his co-pre-eternal sending it, Is it almost like the, not exactly, because we're talking about men versus God, but is it almost like the idea of first among equals, second among equals? No person is inherently better than another person. Yes, but. but but the difference is ultimately that we're all different. Like by virtue of being different persons, we are different beings. Yeah, but I mean yes. the idea of one isn't superior to the other by one person among equals. Yes, yeah. yes. Um, they're all equally God, just like all humans are are in an ontological sense equal. Yeah. All Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are ontologically equal. But in the big distinction is that because. They all share completely the nature of God the Father and act as one, right? They do. They, this is God only acts this way. You and I can act in this way, you know. Uh, Father John can suggest something, and Hanny can do it, and that he does it, right? But that's temporary, because you can say something, and I can just not do it. Yes, yeah. exactly. But 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 because human nature means that you and I act. You, we can I can you know we can be co-equal actors, acting this way. Right or Father John could, you know, act in the other direction. Mm -hmm. Right? Does that make any sense? Yeah. God always acts this way. Let's try to put this. Here. I, I was mainly just trying to. Yeah. You know, the the person second like this. Yeah. So so, the, essentially, what happens is by co-sending the Spirit in existence, both hypostatically, meaning that his actual personal existence, his existence as the third person of the Trinity. Um, uh, is is both a co-sending of the Father and the Son as well as how they operate in the world. They, they break down the distinction between God's existence in and of himself and God's activity in the world by combining the model, if that makes any sense at all. But the whole idea is they're trying to bolster the divinity of the Son by, by, the, by doing this. Um, it's probably clear that they didn't think all this out totally back then when they first started adding it, because there's no actual, there's, there's very little theological discussion of it. It just like, there's a sense that clearly someone thought, well, if the Arians who are ruling over us deny the divinity of the Son, let's, let's make clear that, that the Son is divine because he also sends the Spirit into the world. And it's partially based on interpreting the scriptures where we do say that the Son sends the Holy Spirit into the world, right? After he ascends, he sends the Spirit into the world. But that's, he's being sent into the world, not his eternal existence. Does that, 
so this so essentially the, the filial equation ends up breaking the two combining the two models and creating a, a different model from the apostolic and the model of the early church if you were to ask a well-educated catholic yeah there what would they say like what why would they say that filial, filial equation is actually correct um present day they they would actually argue that this is the correct model because it's, they essentially would yeah. say why what would be um, their one, they would say that it's absurd that God would have a different way of operating towards us, his creation, than he exists in and of himself. Mm -hmm. That's really the, the core of their argument. Um, another thing is that actually you would argue that, that the Holy Spirit being co-sent between... So they, they would use essentially an analogy of, of if, father, if the Father is the lover and the Son is the beloved, the Holy Spirit is the love that unites them, mm -hmm. but they're all love in some way. Okay. Right, but the problem is that it really tends to depersonalize the Holy Spirit. And you actually see that, especially in contemporary Roman Catholicism over the last 500 years, where there's not—I mean, the Holy Spirit just kind of is this vague force and not seem to be actually like. I remember when I converted to Catholicism, actually having prayers to the Holy Spirit was shocking to me, because in the Orthodox Church we have prayers to the Holy Spirit, right? You don't have that really in Catholicism because the person, the personhood of the Holy Spirit, seems to be kind of turned into an abstraction. Again, if you use that model of the lover, the beloved, and love, well, like, okay, like, lover, excuse me, <coughs> sorry, a lover and a beloved are both active agent persons, right? Love is just an abstract concept, but it's and, reality. And, and, so which one has prayers to the Holy Spirit? We do. We, yeah. Yeah, and, and theory, in the Catholic Church does, but like, it's not common, mm -hmm. like, does that make any sense? So I, I was really shocked when I converted. The, the orthodox reasoning is scripture says so. Yes. Okay. The Catholics would actually argue the same thing, but again, our understanding interpretation of scripture is, you know, the the Lord himself says that that the Holy Spirit is proceeds from he doesn't say from the Father and the Son. Christ himself in the scripture says the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. He doesn't say and the Son, he says from the Father. But he, of course, does send the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So we understand that God, as he exists eternally, is different than the way he interacts with his creation. Mm -hmm. Right? He's the creator. He, and we, and this is entirely based on the scriptural revelation. This is based both on scriptural revelation and our own experience of God working. That by virtue of being energized by God, meaning God is the one moving, energizing us, right? Um, inspiring us working through us and we working with him synergy right that, that we offer our human work in synergy with the divine energy right that synergy means to be energized together right and that's what we continue to usually use the word energetic energy even if in modern english that implies like electricity right which is not what it means right um we of course experience the reality that we experience this reality and this is what the scriptures say you know the sun is sent into the world from the Father, who then in turn sends into the world the Holy Spirit. But where there is one acting, all are acting. Mm -hmm. Right? Where there is one, all three are. You can't experience the activity of the Son without the Father and the Holy Spirit, because all divine action is all three persons. Which again, what makes them one God? Right? We say one God, and we say you know He, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, not they. Mm -hmm. Right? And why is it is because they they act by nature as one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Versus we can act as one, but we also can act as separate, distinct agents. Ask any married couple, right? That's right, just, just the reality, right? You're supposed to be one, but a lot of times you, we get in fights, right? That, and that doesn't happen in the Trinity. There's no, there's no um, disputation because the will of the Father that, that the Son and the Holy Spirit are, are, are eternally... You feel like your hand and your foot working against each other. Yeah, although that's even theoretically possible if you've got weird, you know, policies and stuff like that. Oh, is that a cocktail? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so anywho, um, I, well, I, I didn't, my goal was to not explain all the theology today. Sorry. I, I would happily do so another time. The reality is, is that you, you don't actually need to know this theology to be a faithful Orthodox Christian. But I think it's important to know that why we have the split. And the split actually has less to do with the, the, the theology as such. It more has to do with, again, the question of papal authority. We're going to get into it. So, as I said, the, the, the filial quake gets added first in southern Gaul um, by those under the Visigoths as a way to bolster the divinity of the sun against the Visigoths, who were Arians, and therefore who claimed that the 
um, that the that the uh, that the uh, that the Son is not God, right? That he's that God the Father alone is God. Um, uh, then it's first endorsed by any actual official church body when the church in Spain gathers at the Council of Toledo, which is the archbishopric there of Iberia at the time. Um, is this in Ohio? What? No, Toledo in Spain. Uh, um, in 589, so the Council of Toledo gathers, and it's the first time that it actually is formally inserted by a group of bishops into the creed. Um, they don't. There's no actual theology discussed, it's just this was already commonly being done, and it's essentially endorsed by the bishops with no real discussion of theology. Um, from there, it soon spreads to other parts of Gaul and the West in general. It's adopted fairly quickly by the Franks, right? We all know, like, you know, Carolyn, you know, uh, 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 Charlemagne being the, the the most you know famous of the Frankish kings, um, and in 680 it's adopted by the, the Anglo-Saxon Church there um, up in England. Um, however, it remains kind of something that is not theologically discussed. It's being done in certain parts of the West. The um, the papacy continues to actually stand against it, which shows how in an earlier era the papacy wasn't the supreme you know. Uh, the Supreme Bishop of the West, because he actually would regularly say, stop doing this to those who were theoretically under him, but they were doing it anyway, right? Um, but it's never addressed theologically for the first couple hundred years. So again, 589 is the first time you get a, a synodal endorsement of the, of, the, of the filioque at the Council of Toledo, and it's not until 809 that you actually start to see conflict over it in any real way rather than just occasionally the Pope saying, knock it off. Um, so some Frankish monks go on pilgrimage to Jerusalem, not uncommon, right? People would go to the Holy Land on pilgrimage. Um, and there in the Holy Land, they they hear that the Greeks are not using the filioque. They're not saying, and, and the son, of course, it would have been in Greek, but, you know. Um, uh, and so they, 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 they go back to um, the Frankish court and the Frankish church there at Aachen, which was the capital of the Frankish, uh, the Frankish kingdom and empire. Aachen, like the German city now? Yeah, okay. mm -hmm. that's actually where Charlemagne's uh, throne was. It was, yeah, was the city of Aachen. Like German, yeah. yeah. Germany yeah. and France were really Frank, so it was yeah. like a united empire. Yeah, that's not I, I was just clarifying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And mm -hmm. um, yes, Aachen, the, the city in Germany. Katya, you're uh, being a little loud. <laughs> <laughs> um, what? She on the wire. Yeah. Matja has got to do an errand, so she wants to make sure she's screaming that I could go attend to her, but she's probably um, reading right now. This is what she does when she's ready to nap. She sits there and reads aloud. Um, sometimes she pontificates. She puts the book up on the edge of her thing, and, and then she gets it from me. I don't know. She literally starts to, uh, speaking to her, uh, her stuffed animal that are down on the floor. I, I don't know. My father looked at her, whatever. Who knows? Um, Apple of apology. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, so the the the. The Frankish monks are scandalized with the fact that these Greeks are not using the filioque. Well, of course, you know we know from the protective actually knowledge of history that um, the opposite should have been true, right? Uh, that they're the ones who have added something. But they firmly believe, in fact, they have uh, there's a council at Aachen there in 809 in response to this, which is um, which declares that the Greeks have 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 heretically ceased saying the filioque. Right? Again, this shows a total lack of historical knowledge, but what do you expect? This is the tail end of the of the intellectual dark ages there. I mean, like, they're just not a, a good understanding of history, right? Um, and uh, they um, uh, they even reject uh, that, that the, well, I kind of want to, I'm not going to do that, but they, essentially, let's, let's, let's not get too deeply into the theology, but they, the, the gist is, is that they declare that the Greeks have deviated from the apostolic church by removing the filioque from the creed. Which of course is not true, um, and they create a, uh, they start to develop a theological defense of it, although it's really not that um, that well defended. Eight oh nine. Eight oh nine. Yeah. Um, the following year, um, while not getting into any of the theology behind it, Pope Leo the Third, the state ten, uh, condemns the Council of Aachen for its addition of the Philippi to the Creed, saying, uh, "You guys are the ones who actually added something to the Creed. Um, knock it off." And in response, he he um, he has commissioned two large silver plates, which are actually still in Rome. You can go see them. They're at uh, St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Uh, one in Latin, one in Greek of the creed without the filioque <clears throat> put there in the church uh, in the Vatican. And it's so the current, in the current yes. Vatican. Yes, okay. yes, you can go. It's in the narthex of the new Vatican. If you don't know, they, the old St. Peter's Basilica was torn down and rebuilt in the 16th century. 
Um, so it used to be in the church itself. Now it's just in like the like a, in uh, in the narthex. So when you come into the first set of doors before you go into the second, it's okay. off to the to the left actually, if my if my memory serves me. Um, uh, but I haven't been to I haven't been to the Vatican in 15, 16 years, so my memory not might not be serving me. Um, so again, he condemns the Council of Aachen. He doesn't address the theology at all, but he condemns it for their addition to the creed. This is the first time that the Pope actually doesn't just say knock it off, he actually has a, a church council to address it. Um, they, of course, don't listen, but again, this shows the, the fact that despite later claims, the Pope is not the supreme bishop, in the, even in the West, let alone throughout the entire church. The fact that the Pope can hold the council and tell them to stop. And these are people who are theoretically under his patriarchate, and they won't stop. Right? And he has really no recourse other than he could theoretically could have excommunicated a whole lot of them, but you know, you, you pick your battles as any, as any pastor has to, as I know. Um, right? And again, because they hadn't actually addressed, they really hadn't addressed anything dogmatic too much. They, they make some mention of it. He just says it shouldn't be added because it is an addition. This is not the creed that, that we've received from the ecumenical councils. Right? Um, and by the way, the thing I covered last week, if you don't remember or you weren't there, um, the creed is established, is, is established over the first two councils, right? The first council has the first version of the creed. It is edited at the second council. The third council affirms the creed of the second council as the baptismal creed of the church, meaning that's what everyone is baptized with, which is what we do to this day. Um, it's later inserted into the liturgy. But the third council also says that only an ecumenical council like those that, you know, like, like this current gathering or the previous two gatherings, the, the, the only have three of them, can, can make any further additions to the creed. This is not something that any local church can, can alter. This is the universal baptismal creed of belief, of faith, the statement of faith of the church. And only another church-wide gathering of all the bishops, or at least most of the bishops from throughout the church in ecumenical gathering can make a further edit. And this is essentially the reasoning why the Pope condemns the filioque in 810. Um, uh, however, um, that doesn't continue for too long. Um, in 843, um, uh, remember that's when the triumph of orthodoxy happens. So Emperor Theophilus, the iconoclast, who's the last iconoclastic emperor, dies. And his wife, the Empress St. Theodora, ascends to the throne as regent for her young son, Michael. Um, she calls a church council there, uh, which deposes all of the iconoclastic bishops and restores icons to the church the next Sunday, this, the first Sunday of Lent. This is They, they meet on... Um, on the first Monday of Lent. And uh, that includes uh, this council deposes the patriarch who was an iconoclast and replaces them with, uh, with orthodox ones. Um, as part of that, um, uh, uh, um, however, right, she's, she's beginning to put her hands into the life of the church in a way that maybe could be injected at later. So 847, uh, the person she originally had kind of convinced the bishops to put as, a, as an icon duel, an icon venerating uh, patriarch there, St. Methodius of Constantinople, um, who had been the one who actually oversaw the restoration of icons after he had made patriarch the, the, the following week. Um, he dies, and St. Theodora, without having a synod called, without actually having a proper election, which is canonical, which required, a bishop has to be elected by other bishops, right? The faithful can nominate to the synod someone that they want, a, a ruler can, you know, likewise nominate, but only the, the synod can theoretically elect. Um, well, the empress, St. Theodora, um, she's a saint because she restores icons, not necessarily because of this behavior, um, just up and appoints St. Ignatius, the content to, uh, the, to be the successor um, to St. Saint, to Saint Methodius as the patriarch of Constantinople. He says, this is what you're gonna do, and the bishops don't object, they, they go along with it, but it's technically not the way it's supposed to be done, right? That's not, they didn't really elect her, elect him. She just kind of says, this is what you're gonna do, and they say, okay. That's not really an election, is it? It's just accepting the will of, of this secular ruler. Um, uh, well, things are well and good for a while, right? This is 847. In 856, um, the, the, the young Emperor Michael, right? St. Theodore was the regent for, for him. Um, decides to overthrow the regency as at the only the age of 16. Normally the regency would have ended at the age of 20 in the Byzantine Empire. Um, and uh, but this is done with the help of his uncle. And his uncle was not a good guy. Um, in fact, he was in an illicit, adulterous relationship with his daughter-in-law. Um, and so St. Ignatius, as the 
uh, Patriarch of Constantinople condemns him for it and says you have no right to be the second in charge of the empire if you're going to live in such a way. I have certain thoughts of you know Herod and Herodias, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, sim a similar thing. Well, um, uh, that 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 doesn't earn him any favors. And then um, uh, Theodora and um, all of Michael's siblings uh, are forced into monastic life as a form of exile. And um, Saint Ignatius refuses to actually taunter them. Like they're forced in another bishop of doing it, but he refuses to do it. And um, so uh, that makes the new emperor, right? Um, emperor Michael, as well as his chief advisor, his, his uh, adulterous and uh, incestuous uncle, um, decide that they need to get rid of this guy. And um, the synod, or a, good, a chunk of the synod of Constantinople convinces him to, um, to, to resign in order that this con like to not create conflict between the, the emperor and the church. And so he agrees, he voluntarily goes, uh, well, he voluntarily steps down and then immediately is arrested and, and exiled. Because, um, you know, again, we've already established that, uh, that, that not, not the greatest imperial activity there. Um, but he still submits to this. He doesn't complain for the good of the church, right? Because he wants to see the church in a healthy place. Um, in his place, the Synod of Constantinople elects St. Photius, who is probably one of the most learned people in human history. Um, he was, let's just say for simplicity's sake, he was the chief librarian of the, of the, of the great library there in Constantinople. He was a uh, part of this great renaissance that you start to see after the, uh, uh, the restoration of icons where church art, including hymnography and, and learning, all are kind of, there's a, there's a, we, call it, we actually call it the Photian Renaissance after him because he's the leading figure in it. The fact that he becomes the patriarch only you know, adds to that. Um, but he's a layman. So he's tonsured, a monk, ordained to the Kalakalix, and then donned as patriarch in just six days. Um, though he, of course, was chosen because of his renowned scholarship, he was also chosen because both of his parents had been killed by the iconoclasts for their veneration of icons. So he was seen as like, he's not gonna restore iconoclasm. Like, you don't do that if your parents are killed by the iconoclasts, right? Um, that, that puts you above reproach for that concern, which was still a concern. Um, also, the fact that he wasn't yet a bishop meant that he wasn't already invested in the, uh, the politics between the, those who had wanted Ignatius to stand fast against the emperor and those who wanted to see him just like submit. So he was seen as a neutral party within the synod of, of bishops, So that makes any sense. Um, against St. Ignatius' explicit wishes in 859, so this is two years after he's deposed, um, a, a section of the, a, a chunk of the synod, six metropolitans and 15 bishops, um, make an appeal to Pope Nicholas II, sorry, Nicholas I, um, who is, by the way, the first pope um, uh, to make claims of universal authority, universal jurisdiction in the West. And in fact, he had spent the previous two decades um, asserting his absolute control over the church in the West and actually had pretty successfully over his reign um, been able to essentially bring this claim to bear that he is the supreme bishop over everyone and everyone's just his subordinate. When you say the West, you mean his Western Roman Empire? Western Roman Empire. Okay, yes, you, don't, you don't, not include the Eastern Roman Empire. Yes, yes. Um, so he's, he sees this as an opportunity to do the exact same thing to Constantinople he had already done to Canterbury and Toledo and Paris and, and Aachen and the other major you know, archbishoprics where he essentially submitted them to the papacy. Because before then, the bishops were all equal and he was, you know, the pope was the first among equals whenever they would gather. And now he's asserting this, he's the first one to make these claims of, of actual universal supreme authority over the entire church, not even just, you know, his own patriarchate, but everything. And he sees this as an opportunity to assert his control over Constantinople. Um, so uh, he says, he so sends- They appealed to him to do what again? To to essentially restore St. Ignatius to the patriarchal throne. Okay. So importantly, we covered this last uh, last week. One of the things we find in the ecumenical councils is an affirmation of the ancient practice of, of being able to um, appeal to the first among equals, uh, both locally and eventually universally, in cases where your own bishop is, is does something you believe to be unjust. Um, so theoretically, you know, if my bishop does something, I can appeal to Metropolitan Tikhon, and he's supposed to call a synod to address that. Chances are he'll tell me to shut up because I'm just a you know priest who probably doesn't know what I'm talking about, right? But theoretically, that is my that is my court of appeal. Well, 
um, ultimately, if you go up the, the Supreme Court of Appeal, right? And I mean, and that's you know, is is the papacy, and that 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 was the ancient practice of the church, right? Today, theoretically, that is the Patriarchate of Constantinople for the same reason. He's the first among equals. You go up, you go up the chain of of, of, of this, right? So they, they follow the ancient practice. They appeal to Pope Nicholas, and he's all too eager to assert his power over the over the Patriarchate of Constantinople. Um, so, uh, in response to to Saint uh, to Nicholas the First, Pope the Pope's um, objection to Ignatius's deposition, saying that um, he was not consulted and should have been able to to, to give his sign off on this, um, the emperor, with the approval of Saint Photius. Um, convenes, essentially pays for a great synod of all the bishops of the Byzantine Empire, um, and the Pope is invited as well. He doesn't show up himself, he sends delegates. Um, however, uh, the council that theoretically was called at the initiation, really, of, of the Pope's objection, ends up affirming uh, St. Photius as the lawful and canonical patriarch. Right? I mean, he was elected, and St. Ignatius did voluntarily step down, right? Um, and uh, uh, and they show back up in um, <laughs> in Rome, and Pope Nicholas is so furious he actually excommunicates the, the delegates who are there, <laughs> and uh, and he um, and he repudiates the whole thing, right? So in response, he then in 863, so that council was 861. I know there's a lot of dates here, so just bear with me. In 861, so two years later, uh, Pope Nicholas convenes a council in Rome. Uh, where he deposes and excommunicates Photius on the basis that his appointment was uncanonical, because in his mind Ignatius had been unjustly deposed, and um, the Church of Constantinople should have consulted him before having a new bishop. Which was Ignatius voluntarily stepped down. Yes, but the, it's about his asserting of his authority. Yeah. Right. Um, so he's, he's, he says that they should have consulted him. Also, he argues that. Photius was not eligible for the episcopacy because he wasn't, he wasn't, he wasn't already a monk. But um, we do look at church history; that's actually fairly common. Uh, Saint Ambrose of Milan being most famous, he was, he went from being a layman to the the Archbishop of Milan in, in three days. So, like, you know, precedents very much there. And there's other examples of that, right? Um, that's not actually in canon law anywhere. Theoretically, any celibate male can be elected. You know, if Metropolitan Antikon died, our synod could let any celibate male who's an Orthodox Christian to succeed him. Is that normal? No, it's usually another bishop because you don't want to put someone in charge uh, as the first among equals who has no experience even administering their own diocese, right? That's usually a, you know, you don't hire someone for a job, uh, you know, and put them, make them the CEO, right? Unless, off the street, right? That's, yeah. just, that's just dumb, right? They have to be an extraordinary. Exactly. And, St. Ambrose was, St. Photius was. I mean, he was this renowned scholar who's, we, we name a whole period of Byzantine history, or at least Byzantine thought, the, the Photian Renaissance after him, because he's the leading figure of it, right? Uh, it was also called the, the, the Akana, uh, Akana Duel, I mean, the icon venerating uh, Renaissance, because it's, it's really led by, by the victory over iconoclasm. Um, so Pope Nicholas is trying to assert his authority this way. Um, so this actually leads to what we call the Photian Schism. It's the, the, where the Church of Rome and the Church of Constantinople are in schism. They're not in communion with one another, not permanently, but from 863 for when this happens to, um, to uh, 867 when Pope Nicholas dies, there's a schism um, between, uh, between the two churches. Um, but in 867, before uh, Pope Nicholas dies, St. Photius calls a council with over 1,000 clergy in attendance. This council excommunicates Nicholas, uh, again, redoubling the, I guess, the, the, the schism, right, um, for his overreach of authority um, it, by condemning his claim to uh, to this supremacy. Not that he's, he's the first among equals, but he actually has authority over how local churches actually elect. He has, he has no authority over that. He only has a say over his own synod in that direct way. Um, um, unless in cases of appeal, then he, he has the, the duty to adjudicate if there's, a, if there's a conflict, right? To adjudicate what's canonical, but it's still based on the canon, it's not based on, on him making up authority, right? So it condemns him for that. It also uh, condemns the fact that he's been trying to, this is on the side, but I'm just letting you know, he'd been trying to assert his authority over the church in Bulgaria as well. So it condemns him for that, um, even though it was part of the Church of Constantinople. And it also condemns 
um, because say Photius had begun to notice that they were you know doing this weird filioque thing and also uh, condemns the addition of the filioque without making any dogmatic statements it just simply says it should be added because it's against the, the church to add to the creed without an ecumenical council um, okay, so back you, you have not yet addressed when the papacy began to officially incorporate it yes no it, it, it um, yes it hasn't even happened yet Okay. But the fact that you have it being done in the West and that Pope is not doing anything, how can he claim to have authority over the ch whole church if he okay. hasn't even been able to stop the Franks and the Spaniards and the English mm -hmm. from from doing the yeah. Catholic? He so clearly doesn't like, have authority over the ones he's supposed to have authority yes, over, yes. so how can he act? Yeah, but it, it, but it takes advantage of that to say that we condemn mm -hmm. the addition. Okay. Right? Um, but uh, um, in September of that year, um, the Emperor Michael is uh, is is killed in a coup by his co-emperor Basil, right? Because you, you know in the Byzantine Empire you always have the Augustus and the Caesar, just like you had. So the Caesar, so this is essentially the second second in command, as it happens many times in Byzantine history, kills the Emperor Michael. Um, but because it's done with essentially open murder, uh, Saint Photius refuses communion to Basil. He excommunicates Basil over the murder, um, and. So Basil, who actually sought an alliance with the Pope in order to bolster his own position, deposed, you know, uses his imperial authority to essentially exile and imprison um, St. Photius, and he calls back St. Ignatius because he figures this, could, this is going to make him good with the Pope. Um, and uh, um, uh, however, uh, with the fact that St. Ignatius is restored, he doesn't actually repudiate the council that was done earlier that year. Um, but it becomes a moot point because Pope Nicholas dies in November of that year. So 867 was, 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 was an eventful year. Um, uh, the Emperor Basil wanting to actually be able to depose from any authority, any, not just be imprisoned in exile, but actually depose him from the episcopacy. Three years later, in, um, in 870, calls a council to formally depose St. Photius and to formally reinstate Ignatius rather than just him have having used his imperial authority to manhandle that. Um, and uh, at that, St. Photius is deposed and anathematized um, by essentially the, the Pope and, and the Emperor. Um, uh, however, um, that doesn't last forever, um, even though he had been anathematized and deposed, because in 876, um, uh, Basil essentially doesn't see the the alliance with the Pope as useful anymore, so he allows Photius to return from exile, um, and he becomes Saint Ignatius's chief advisor, because there was never a conflict between the two of them, right? I, I, like they were all caught up in politics; they had no ill will towards one another. Um, in fact, he sees, well, he was my sort of predecessor and successor, right? Um, I'm going to rely on him for his wisdom. Um, and then Saint Ignatius, at this point, is is in failing health, so he actually asks the synod to. When he does die, and he dies, uh, he dies the next year um, to restore Saint Photius to the patriarchal seat. Right? What? Okay. what? Sorry, there's a lot of. No, no, it's yeah. funny because just like all this, just for him to the wind up the square one. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. But, but again, my point is, I'm trying to show through this. It's it's about the Pope conveniently over this, trying to assert his authority. Um, but it's it's firmly kind of trounced, but it ends up winning out anyway. Um, Saint Ignatius who dies in 877, and Saint Photius, despite actually protesting and saying, I just want, I'm happy just being a scholar again, uh, is, is restored by the Synod. Uh, um, so hoping to end the controversy once and for all in 879, so two years after Saint Photius uh, dies, because the, the Pope is objecting continuously to the fact that this deposed and anathematized, you know, supposed heretic and, and, and ne'er-do-well is, is the patriarch again. Um, the Emperor Basil invites the whole church to gather in Constantinople. Um, representatives, bishops from Pope John the Eighth are there, um, as well as the Patriarch of Constantinople and the Patriarchs of Jerusalem, Antioch, and, uh, and Alexandria. So, you know, and lots of bishops. That's actually nearly 400 bishops were there. Um, it actually uh, confirms St. Photius as the rightful patriarch, saying that he was only deposed and anathematized because of imperial activity, it wasn't that he was had any canonical reason to be there, uh, and it, um, the, the creed without the filioque is read out, and, um, uh, and this council, um, 
which again, though not ecumenical in terms of we don't believe it's deciding anything dogmatic, um, that's why it's not an ecumenical council. It certainly has a lot of authority because it is ecumenical in form. You have bishops from pretty much the entire church there. Um, offers a pronouncement uh, condemning those who, this is a quote, impose on it the creed, their own invented phrases, and put this forth as a common lesson to the faithful, or to those who return from some kind of heresy, and display the audacity to falsify completely the antiquity of this sacred and venerable rule of faith with illegitimate words, additions, or subtractions. Right? It's, again, it's, a, it's, it's not condemning the filioque as, as, a, as a doctrinal point. It's simply condemning the fact that, like, this is not the ancient teaching of the church. You don't add or subtract to it without another ecumenical council, meaning on their own, anyone who does it on their own. Um, and, uh, of course, it pokes fun. I mean, in in, a, in the way that in the ways that you know statements like this do pokes fun at the fact that there's this you know false claim to antiquity to the filioque, which we know it's not, but that's what the West was arguing at this point. Um, later, after a few years, we don't know exactly when it was written, but either five to eight years later, between 885 and 888, Saint Photius writes his treatise against the filioque called the Mystagogy of the Holy Spirit. Interestingly, on Friday night, one of our catechumens had read that. Um, it's more or less the church's kind of formal, at least it's the basis for our later condemnations of it, right? Um, St. Photius dies in 893, and the whole thing kind of dies. Again, you, you have this great council of the church that condemns not the filioque as dogma, but condemns the papal claim to being able to add to it, or anyone's claim to being able to add to it. Did they go in or you just, just for a sec? My phone's still there. Okay, sorry, yeah. Uh, um, I'll wait till it comes back because we're, we're uh, well. I guess so. Before we move on, you know, does this I mean, there's a lot of details here, but does that all make this all kind of make sense? It's kind of the papacy is constantly trying to enforce this, and the church never at this point hasn't really condemned it, but neither has the papacy given a dogmatic reason for it. It's all about really by attempting to impose the filioque, well, rather by. It's attempting to assert the authority of the of the papacy over the over Constantinople and the rest of the church, right? And so this is where the, the issue lies. And it's become problematic um, in a moment, but I'm going to wait until Annie's back. So um, while we're waiting, any questions about? Again, there's a lot of details. Well, I, I don't have a question about this, but yeah. you know, everybody's been asking us about sponsors for our yeah. baptism. Yeah. And that. Um, do we just ask somebody, or what do we? Yeah, we... yeah, we're being recorded, so I don't want to go into too much detail because uh, it's mm -hmm. kind of a private thing. But um, I think you know, Sid already has chosen someone, right? You're gonna have mm -hmm. Michael Gallus. Sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah I, I won't deny. Or okay. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, that's more of a private conversation, though. But we do need to have you guys choose some some sponsors. Um, you could be right. the three of you could have someone. Uh, a couple, you know, um, but at bare minimum, um, you can choose a couple individually or as, as the remaining family group, but at bare minimum, um, you would have to choose a woman and you two would have to choose a man. Um, they should be people that you look up to in the faith, meaning someone you can actually rely on as someone who can help guide you and you can go you know, ask them questions. Obviously, that doesn't mean you can't continue to ask me questions. I'm still a priest. My job is to continue to to teach the faithful, oh, right? Yeah. You know, regardless of whether you're catechumens or not. Um, but, uh, um, but, but, but it should be someone that you, you know, actually look up to. Is you know, um, and so consider that. I know that you know um, we've, we've talked a little bit about it before, but um, maybe you know if you want, we can briefly talk about it once the camera's off. Um, mm -hmm. I just you know again, it's it's more of a private conversation. Mm -hmm. and I, I don't want it going online. Um, but any 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 questions that you might have while we're waiting that are more... Um, oh, here's, here's Annie coming back now, so never mind. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, so at this point in history, the, po the papacy I mean, and the Constantinople churches, they're different in that terms. Why the split kind of doesn't really make sense to me either, nor does... Uh, the Yeah. Yeah. Well, let let me let me keep going because the, the story the sto we're in the midst of the story, right? Right. So. It's about to get real weird. 
actually, it's anything that's going to get clear, um, I, I hope. Because um, right now we, we have this initial controversy over over, Saint, uh, over what we call the Photian controversy, the Photian schism, right? Um, this is the first attempt, though. Um, but it's hard to go through it because it is such a weird, complicated political mess. It becomes less of a political mess, though, thankfully, as the as the story goes on. Um, again, so we, we, we we're kind of, again, in, eight, in eight, 879, we have this council in Constantinople, which rejects any 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 papal ability to add to the creed and rejects the papal claim to have the final say in who the patriarch of Constantinople is, right? If someone's unjustly deposed, of course he could hear the appeal, um, but but ultimately, you know, he can't, he doesn't have, he doesn't have any authority over the election of who's gonna be the patriarch, you know, the patriarch, that, that's the responsibility of the local church any more than the that Constantinople has no say over what Jerusalem or Antioch or, uh, or, or Alexandria um, choose to do, right? Um, so things kind of settle down, right? So 879, things are kind of left. Nothing really happens much in terms of the controversy, especially because after Pope Nicholas's death, you don't see another pope for a while who attempts to, um, who attempts to assert these claims, at least not as strongly. They continue to assert them over the West, but not over the East. Um, but the next kind of major point is over 100 years later, 150 years or so. So in 1014, for the first time ever, the creed is included in the mass with the filioque. So the filioque is included in the creed as it is sung at mass in Rome. What year? In 1014. So this is 100, 140 odd years later. Um, up until that point, despite the fact that they weren't able to they continued to condemn it. They weren't able to stop anyone in the West who was already saying it, but it hadn't actually been um, ever said in, in, in the creed in essentially Northern Italy, in Rome in particular, but Northern Italy in general. Um, but it was included there in 1014 for the first time um, at the request of uh, King or Emperor Henry II of the Holy Roman Emperor, because um, essentially um, it was, um, it was Pope Benedict the um, the Eighth, who was the Pope at the time, owed his restoration to the papal throne to the Holy Roman Emperor. So he essentially was in his debt, and so the Holy Roman Emperor says, "Well, I'm going to be coming to Mass in Rome, and you better include it because that's what I'm used to doing." And the Pope relents, and um, and thereafter becomes uh, the norm in Rome itself and Northern Italy shortly thereafter, by extension. Once Rome begins to do it, everyone in Northern Italy follows suit. Um, uh, so this you know, is not initially addressed by any other church, but this is when, again, Rome uh, essentially begins to, in Rome itself, the Pope himself begins to say the filioque. Again, heretofore, there's been no actual dogmatic discussion about the filioque. It's all been about the authority of the Pope. And that actually remains the case as we continue on with the story. So um, in 1054, which is usually the conventional date of when the split happens, although it's really not that simple, um, in 1054, um, the new pope, Leo XI, um, discovers that Constantinople is, again, why he doesn't know this beforehand, who knows, but he discovers that, that Constantinople is not using the filioque. On the one hand, on the other hand, he discovers that they're using leavened blood bread in the Eucharist because at this point the, the West, first the Franks and thereafter, um, had begun to use unleavened bread. Right? And I'm not going to get into that whole controversy, but the fact of the matter is, is that that's not actually the ancient custom of the church. The ancient custom of the church we know uh, universally until the eighth century was was leavened bread, and then the Franks in the eighth century, and then thereafter, um, eventually spreading to the papacy. Um, begin to use uh, unleavened bread. We're not going to get into that, but this is the thing. So he hears from, uh, again, some uh, some people who traveled to Constantinople that they're not using the filioque, these heretics, and they're using leavened bread in the Eucharist, these heretics, right? Um, that's essentially a thing. So um, he, uh, um, he claims, basing, uh, basing this claim on a forged Eighth century document called the Donation of Constantine, which is supposedly Saint Constantine gives universal authority to the whole church to the Pope of Rome. This is not actually true. We know it's a forged document. 
most people believe it was forged back then too, but he says we have this document in the library, so it must be real. I mean, <laughs> is it universally today, today uh, accepted oh, as yeah. forged? Oh, yeah. like, everyone knows like, it. You can't be an honest scholar. I mean, I'm sure there's some wacky Catholics out there who argue with this legitimate, but like any 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 like reasonable Catholic scholar who actually has credentials and is participating in scholarship will be like, yeah, well, yeah, we know it's forged. Like it doesn't like. It doesn't appear. It uses Latin from the eighth century. You know, yeah. it uses language that you would never have found Saint Constantine using. Like again, it doesn't appear in any document. We have no documentary evidence until the until yeah. the eight hundreds or the eighth century. I'm sorry. Um, so Pope Leo the eleventh sends Cardinal um, Humbert or Umberto <laughs> to negotiate with with the patriarch Michael Cellularius. Cool name. Just means he's he was the cell attendant of the of the previous patriarch. But Cellularius is a, is a Cool last name, I'm just going to say. Cool epitaph. Uh, who refused, of course, he refuses to accept the Pope's dogmatic authority, right? Pope sends this delegate, his, this cardinal, a bishop, um, to say you need to accept the filioque and you need to start using unleavened bread. And the patriarch says, no, this is, this is not the ancient custom. And the Pope has no authority to impose that on, on us or any other local church. So in response, because he won't accept the Pope's demands, on Saturday, July 16th of the year of our Lord, 1054, on Saturday morning as they're celebrating a memorial liturgy for the dead, uh, Cardinal Humbert enters Hagia Sophia, which is the cathedral, you know, now it's, um, the, it's a mosque, but it was the cathedral of Constantinople there, um, as Patriarch Michael is celebrating the divine liturgy, and along with the gifts, which have just been placed on the altar, slams down a bowl of excommunication on the altar with the gifts, which is, you know, not just Slams down a what? A bowl of excommunication, a, a, doc, a decree and of excommunication. Cardinal Humbert, who is the representative from that, the, the Pope Leo XI sent. Yeah. Um, Patriarch Michael actually uh, runs out of the church after him and begs him not to do this because it's like he doesn't want to see communion broken, but Cardinal Humbert just goes back to Rome and ignores him. Um, but because you, you, you have this done on July 20th, so uh, four days later, um, the Synod of Constantinople gathers and responds by, in turn, um, anathematizing Humbert and his colleagues. But then after the Pope, who actually at this point there's a new Pope because Pope Leo had died while Humbert was in Constantinople, uh, Victor II um, uh, affirms Humbert's excommunication, right? It wasn't just them act, because Constantinople assumes it was like reasonable and benefit of the doubt. The Patriarch and the Synod assume it's Humbert acting as a hothead on his own, not with papal authority. Well, once the Pope um, confirms and affirms that Humbert was acting as he should have acted, uh, Constantinople actually expands the um, the anathema and the excommunication to um, to uh, the Pope as well, and those who follow the Pope, which means the entire you know Western half of the Church. And again, the anathema and the excommunication was not about the filioque as such. It was about the Pope claiming that he had the authority to not only add the filioque to the creed, but to impose that on the Church Universal, as well as the question of unleavened bread, right? And that's not even, you know, frankly, the unleavened bread thing is not even dogmatic. It's it's traditional that we use leavened bread, but if that had been the only thing, there really wouldn't be a super big issue, except for the Pope would maybe still have claimed the authority to impose that on the whole Church, which again, is the core issue. That's what I want to say here. Though we, the filioque is, is the is the kind of theme that causes the problem, right? It's the occasioning theme. The actual thing that causes the split is the papal claims to have universal dogmatic authority over the entire church and universal um, jur juridical authority, the ability to you know depose and and install bishops locally as he sees fit. Um, the last holdouts in all of Western Europe are, are forced really to accept the filioque in 1098. So from then on, everyone under the papacy is saying that the filioque in the creed from 1098 onwards. Um, and in the midst of that, um, you have the, the first crusade. In 1098, the first crusade conquers Antioch and slaughters the Orthodox population there, um, as well as the Muslims. They, they don't just discriminate, but this doesn't leave a good taste in anyone's mouth, obviously. And they also kill the, the patriarch of Antioch in the midst of this slaughter. 
and they install in his place a, a Latin patriarch. And this establishes, therefore, to this day, you have a parallel um, uh, Catholic Church of Antioch and an Orthodox Church of Antioch. So this creates a schism, because again, before then, from 1054, it was only Constantinople and Rome who were, in, who were split. Antioch, Jerusalem, and Alexandria were in communion with both. But in 1098, uh, Antioch condemns the Pope's installing of his own patriarch in place of the slaughtered <laughs> patriarch of Antioch. Right, and they elect their own, which creates the schism ultimately between Antioch and Rome. So now Antioch has essentially sided with Constantinople against the overreach against Rome, of Rome, I should say. Um, the next year, uh, the same thing happens in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is conquered in 1099 by the First Crusade, where they established you know, the Kingdom of Jerusalem. And uh, the, um, the, the Patriarch of Jerusalem is not killed, he's exiled, um, because they don't slaughter the population of Jerusalem like they did in Antioch. But um, a, a papal patriarch is imposed on the, on the church there, um, which then means that the schism is growing, because, because now Jerusalem, likewise, is condemning the overreach of the papacy. Again, it's not even about the Philoquia in those two cases. It's about the pope essentially deposing the, the actual, authentic, you know, locally elected patriarch with his own, his own appointee, essentially who is always from the West. He's a Latin, uh, you know, a Latin, uh, Latin-speaking patriarch. Um, but uh, interestingly, Alexandria is the last holdout. We'll get into that in a sec. But really, despite all this, um, especially in Constantinople, the, the Antiochians had, had very quickly, uh, because of the sack of Antioch by the Crusaders, you know, really not liked the, the, the West. But especially in Constantinople, there was a strong hope for reunion continuously, right? Yeah. And there was a sense that they were one church still, that we're in schism. Temporary, you know, just like right now, how we'll get into this in the next in the next week's lesson, but you know, right now, Constantinople and Moscow are out of communion with one another. Um, that's sad, it's not good, but the reality is is that, you know, the whole church itself is not broken asunder. Right now it's just those two that are in conflict, God willing that can be healed. There's a strong sense that no one neither side sees themselves as a distinct religious body. Right? They're there's a conflict there. Um, so there was a sense that, you know, yes, this is going on, but, you know, the faithful would still would still regularly commune in one another. You know, if you were a Latin merchant going to Constantinople, you'd go to communion there, or vice versa. If you were a Greek merchant, you went to Florence or Venice or wherever, you go to communion there. Yeah, the bishops weren't celebrating, the priests weren't celebrating, but despite that, you know, you still had a, a Latin-speaking, uh, Benedictine monastery at Mount Athos until the 1200s, like there's still a, a strong sense of we're still, the average person still really saw it as still one church, even if there was this growing schism that was un, unresolved now for quite some time. There's an aspect of that today still, isn't there? There's something yes. about you, you, if you're Orthodox, you can still receive communion from Catholics. Or we don't, the Catholics say that the Orthodox can receive communion. Okay, but the Orthodox say you can't. Okay. And I'll get, we'll, we'll get, we'll get into that. Week. Well, not next week, but you and I can talk about that more one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but yeah, no, the, the Catholics say that Orthodox can receive communion in their churches. The Orthodox say that the Catholics cannot, nor can we. To do so for us would be an act of apostasy. If you went to a Catholic church, they'd invite you to communion, but if you went, that would be, we'd see you as joining the Catholic church. Essentially, you'd have to come back through repentance, which um, is, is, is important, but it's not what we're covering today. So at some point, you and I can sit down about that. Um, and maybe the whole group can. Um, but that all changes in 1204. If you don't know what happened in 1204, well, the Fourth Crusade is launched and, and they sack Constantinople. They're supposed to go to the Holy Land and they decide that instead they're, gonna, they're going to sack and plunder the city of Constantinople. Well, what happens when you have a crusading army of people uh, theoretically under a papal banner, not theoretically, they are under a papal banner, destroying your city <coughs> and uh, carrying away all your riches, including most of your nice you know, relics of saints? And things like this, um, you you very quickly it doesn't simply become a conflict of bishops and priests. It becomes a conflict very much on a visceral level of the faith, which had already really been between Antioch and 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 um, Rome for the same reason. So the sack of Constantinople really is the first thing that, in the mind of the average person on the street or in the pew, or you know, they had pews then, but you know what I mean, in the in the congregation, right? This is what creates this sense of they're a separate religion because brothers in the faith don't do this to one another. 
Yes, they might go to war. Yes, they might conquer each other's cities. But this utter sack and destruction of a city where where three quarters of the population of the city is 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 either killed or taken back into slavery. You don't do that to your your fellow co-religionists, right? Um, and so it really creates the real sense of this actually being a schism in an emotional sense, though not formally yet, because Alexandria is still at this point in communion with both. Um, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I, I, I was mistaken when I said 1098. There, in 1098, all the Italian um, uh, churches, all the Italian bishops except the Filio Clay, I'm sorry. The last holdout in the West is actually the, the Archbishopric of Paris, which only adopts the filioque in 10 in 1240. They're the last. So the the, the filioque is only universal in the West. I'm sorry, in 1240, it's universal in Italy in 1098. I need to make sure to clarify my notes there. That's what it actually says in my notes. I just didn't read it. Um, but again, at this point, there is not a. Um, there's still not a dogmatic issue about the filioque. It's all about the papal authority. Um, importantly, also in 1204. Um, in addition to the sack of Constantinople, the Pope places a patriarch on the throne, which until the Greeks reconquer Constantinople 40 years later, there's not even, the patriarch of Constantinople is in exile in Nicaea across the Bosphorus, right? Because again, the Pope is trying to impose this authority. He's using the Venetians and the Crusaders as an opportunity to oppose his authority over the whole church, right? Which he had done in Antioch in 1098 and in Jerusalem in 1099. Um, one benefit of like Saladin's reconquest is it allows the, the Orthodox Church to reestablish the rightful patriarchate, even though there was always one in exile, like to actually have them in in Jerusalem and, and in Antioch. Um, you know, I'm not saying we, you know, we don't love Saladin, but you know, it was a benefit. Um, but uh, the in, in the face of all this, the the Roman Catholic Church decides um, to hold a council, what's called the Second Council of Lyons, held in the city of Lyon in France. For some reason, when we refer to it in church history or history terms, we still use the, the traditional English name of the city, which is Lyons. Uh, just like Paris, we don't say Paris, but for some reason, we still, in history, in history classes, still say Lyons versus Lyon, but it's the same city, which is, of course, in southern France. Uh, the Second Council of Lyon, Lyons is the first time that a dogmatic position of uh, in regards to the filioque is taken. This is the first time that the Latins, they actually condemn the, the Greeks, they say. Uh, it's a council against the Greeks um, for their heresy for refusing to accept the filioque. One year again? Uh, 1274. And um, uh, it's actually in response to the fact that the emperor wants to reunite the churches. And despite all this, because Constantinople has been retaken by the, the Greeks, but they're in a uh, not good situation and they'd like to kind of rejoin the the Commonwealth of Western Nations, essentially. Not that there's an EU or anything like that, but it's like, well, we need to get back good with y'all so that the Turks can't, can't, uh, can't you know, wreck us. Um, uh, and so in response, the Pope holds the Second Council of Lyons, which essentially gives the conditions for which a reunion would be possible, which is they, they offer a dogmatic defense of the Philoque and, and say you have to accept this in order to for union to happen, which of course they don't. We will get into that in a moment. Um, but in particular, the dogmatic declaration of the Second Council of Lyons in regards to the Filioque is that the Holy Spirit proceeds eternally from the Father and from the Son, not from as from two principles, but from a single principle, um, which they translate into Greek as aki, which means like um, the same origin as monarch, like the, the first, you know, the first principle of something, or in Latin, principium. Um, not by two spirations, that is a fancy way of saying not by two breathing forths, but by a single breathing forth. Right? So that's why I realized when I did it the first time I had to make it so that it's one, right? To conform to the actual dogmatic position of the Roman Catholic Church. Um, uh, importantly, also the Second Council of Lyons uh, adds another issue to the whole schism, uh, which is that it establishes the dogma of purgatory and condemns the Orthodox for not, not preaching purgatory which of course is only something you see in the 12th century, about 100 years before, I think 150 years before, even appearing in any document ever. Like it's something that the Roman Catholic Church really shortly after the schism begins to just develop as a, as a response to certain 
theological questions, and it's first dogmatized as an official part of the Roman Catholic faith at Second Lions, as well as the filioque being dogmatized. Um, uh, but again, they, because because again, up until this point, the Greeks had generally been willing to accept the filioque, even though they didn't like that the Pope had added it. They really was about to get the papal authority to add it. It was they were like, if you want to believe it, that's fine, because up until this point, it wasn't clear what was even actually meant by the filioque, right? It was words that were added, but there was no explanation of what this meant. Well, here you have it explained, which is actually persist precisely what St. Photius had argued it means and why we can accept it, which is that it makes the, the spirit eternally proceed from the Father and the Son rather than energetically, rather than as God acts in the world, right? So 11 years later in 1285, um, under the co-presidency of the Patriarch of Constantinople and the Patriarch of Alexandria. So this is where Alexandria ultimately joins in with the schism. And so some people actually argue that 1285 is the better date to date the Great Schism to because yes, Constantinople and Rome have been out of communion since uh, uh, 1054, but Alexandria remains in communion with both up until 1285. So under the co-presidency, in response to the Second Council of Lyons, uh, uh, the Patriarch of Constantinople and the Patriarch of Alexandria um, and, uh, hold a great council with representatives, bishops of all the Eastern Patriarchates, um, although only those two patriarchs of the four are there in Constantinople. Um, the Second Council of Lyons is condemned, um, but they do offer an olive branch because again, there's still a hope that the schism can be healed, at least on, well, I'm really on both sides, but the question is, is on the Latin side, it's the hope of the schism being healed is that the Eastern churches all accept the papal, papal decrees, and our hope is that we can reach a compromise. Um, so the second, the, the, the Council of Constantinople of 1285 says that the Catholic position is heretical if by principium or archi, which is, archi is the, I'll write that, so can have it, but the, Latin, the Latin word that they use is, Council of Lions is Principium, that's there, and they, they translate into Greek as Archi, right? Um, which is in like origin of like Arc, like monarch is the one ruler. Well, this is like the the first principle, the, the, the first thing. Um, the Council of Constantinople says that we can even accept this language if by this you do not mean, uh, I'll say, uh, does not equal, although it's on the side, so I don't know if it really helps. Um, the Greek word atia, which means cause, as in, is, do the Father and the Son actually cause the Holy Spirit's existence, right? Like that's, the, we're willing to compromise, right? Because they, the problem is, is that obviously we're, we're responding in Greek and they're ultimately writing in Latin. So they're saying like, you don't mean this, we can even accept that. Because we want to see it, or we still don't want to see it in the creed because that's overreach of the papacy. So if you're willing to remove it to the creed, you can even keep the same dogmatic statement as long as you don't mean by that, the, that's an A by the way, the Greek word atia, which means cause. As in, um, like Aristotle's four causes, but in this case meaning the actual cause of the Holy Spirit's existence. Because again, in the patristic and, and scriptural model, the Father alone is the cause of the Holy Spirit. Even though it's an eternal cause, a co-pre-eternal cause. So that's our model, right? We're willing to accept a, sort of this model if we do not mean that the actual cause of the Holy Spirit's existence is the Father and the Son cooperating um, with a single principle, a single sending forth. Additionally, and this is a, an important thing for our response to this, we make a distinction between um, the hypost oh, wait, this is a color. Um, the hypostatic procession H hypostatic procession of the Holy Spirit, um, meaning the Holy Spirit's personal existence, right, is is from the Father alone, and the energetic procession, which of course is from the Father and the Son, right, meaning the Son together with the Father sends the Holy Spirit into the world, and this is because the Latin word. Uh, processio or procedere, right, to be sent forth, has a, a broader meaning than the Greek words. In Greek, they define hypostatic procession as 
as uh, <clears throat> ek poreusis, which means to issue forth as from a, a source, an origin, to flow forth from an origin, versus uh, simply proeum, which means simply being moved forward, right, sent forward. Um, but the Latin means both. And so again, it's saying if by, if when you say procession proceeds from the Father, you only mean the, uh, the simply being sent forth rather than flowing forth as from a place of origin, then we'll accept that too. You still can't include it in the creed. We're, we, we, we will not condemn the dogma of the filioque if you are willing to clarify that it doesn't mean what it could be interpreted to mean in the worst case scenario, essentially. Because um, again, there's a hope of restoration. Although, again, um, uh, with this, the schism is complete because the, um, the, the, Latin, the Latin church never responds to this, and Alexandria has now also excommunicated the papacy. So 1285 is when you get the actual split in the sense of all the Eastern patriarchates and the, um, and the papacy are now in split. But um, there's still a hope of reunion. Both sides, at this point, despite this now kind of firm split between East and West, the five, sorry, the four patriarchs of the East and the, uh, and the one patriarch of the West. Despite this being split, there's still a sense of we are one church that is just split asunder. And so there's a real hope on both sides to see reunion, although nothing happens for quite a while. So again, the Council of Constantinople, which addresses this, the Second Council of Lyons in 1285, the next thing that has anything to do with any of this is in 1438, so another 150 years later, where the Council of Ferrara is called uh, in and um, uh, the Patriarch of Constantinople, as well as a good number of bishops from the Church of Constantinople, um, uh, uh, as well as um, a few from Antioch, um, gather in Italy in the town of Ferrara. But then this is moved to Florence, which is why it's usually called the Council of Florence uh, in 1439, because uh, the plague breaks out in Ferrara, and they want to get away from the plague. Also, the Florentines, uh, the Medicis, everyone's from the Medicis, uh, uh, volunteered to bankroll the whole thing. So uh, that's, that's well, why. It. Well, it helps, you know. Um, um, so the Eastern bishops show up with a lot of optimism. Their understanding was that for the first time, we're actually going to sit down, not as separate councils, but as one group of people from East and West, and sit down and work through this theology and like come to a like a compromise and sure. and 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 and, um, and every you know and, and 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 you know restore the union of the church. Um, uh, however, very quickly they realize that's actually not the case. They show up with documents. They show up with like tomes of, of literature to try to like they essentially show up with libraries to be able to like be a mobile research <laughs> research unit. You know, yeah. um, they show up with a lot of optimism, especially. The leader of the uh, of not the patriarch himself, who's nominally the leader, but the intellectual leader, Saint Mark of Ephesus, um, had in preparation for this council um, spent two years studying with Dominicans, uh, like Thomists, to try to like understand Thomistic theology, so that he could he could interact with them. And he comes with all these 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 treaties that he you know treaties treatises that he's he's written with a lot of optimism. Um, however, they show up and they realize very quickly. You know, in Ferrara there, and then later in Florence, um, that uh, in fact this is not the case of the council. This, the purpose of this council is to force, um, quite violently, to force the Eastern bishops to sign off on these papal decrees. Um, they show up, and they are essentially put under house arrest. They're not allowed to leave. Um, they are, they are starved. The Eastern bishops have to sell their vestments in order to have enough money for food, and even then they have to essentially beg. Uh, you know, neutral parties to be couriers because they're under house arrest. Um, and they're essentially starved into eventually signing. Um, all the bishops end up signing a, a statement which affirms the filioque and in particular says that yes, we actually mean etia. It, the, the Latin document inserts that Greek word into it, right? Like this is what we mean. We mean a single cause. By when we say single principle, we actually mean a single cause of existence. So the Father and the Son together are the cause of the Holy Spirit. They, they, the, the Holy Spirit's eternal existence 
you know, equal with God the Father, is not simply the Father sending forth, but it is, again, the Father and the Son eternally sending forth the Holy Spirit. Um, it also dogmatizes and, and, uh, uh, and the full expression of what purgatories have become, including the whole indulgent system, which of course leads to the Protestant Reformation. We're not gonna get into all that in our class here because it's not really pertinent to the Orthodox Church. Um, but it dogmatizes, and of course it forces them to sign this, right? Because essentially for a year and a half, the Eastern bishops are all, I'm sorry, the Eastern bishops are all um, kept under house arrest and starved. And so m most of them, uh, except for St. Mark of Ephesus, who had gone as the great scholar of the group, um, signed the document. He refuses to sign, but after keeping them you know, under house arrest and starvation for a year and a half, um, the Pope gives up, but figures, well, I mean, at least all of them, including the patriarch, signed it, so like, we're okay. Um, however, uh, the vast majority of them, the second they get back home, they, they make public penance, they, they say we only did so under duress, you know, that they essentially refuse to, to enforce what they, you know, what they signed. Um, uh, there's a couple of exceptions to that. One of those is Isdor of Kiev, which we'll cover in our next lesson, because uh, he's a major, he's the, he's the metropolitan of, of, of Moscow, so the head of the Russian church was one of the ones who actually embraced that, and he is literally uh, sent out of the city of Moscow on uh, being drugged behind a chariot. Like, he's, uh, they, they're not, they don't, they, they, they don't respond well when, they're, when their bishop comes back, who not just signs it, but actively has, seems to embrace it. He has a fleet to Rome and becoming cardinal. Um, it's true. Uh, anyway, um, uh, and um, we'll cover this next week, but it's, it's important for the history of the Russian church. Um, but because the patriarchs of uh, Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem uh, hadn't even been there, right, um, as well as uh, the rest of the bishops of Russia, only the, the bishop of Moscow, um, all the Romanian bishops, all the Serbian bishops, none of them were there. Um, so they all just rejected outright immediately. Um, however, because the patriarch uh, continues to affirm it, there's kind of an internal schism within orthodoxy for a few years until the fall of Constantinople. Um, but uh, really, the patriarch. yeah, the patriarch continues to affirm it, and the emperor continues to only allow pro-unionist patriarchs to be elected until the fall of Constantinople, because what happens with the fall of Constantinople? Well, the emperor loses his authority, so the church is able to depose the unionist patriarch at that point and, and elect a, a, you know, one who repudiated mm -hmm. Florence, right? Um, because again, really, it's only a couple of bishops who actually seem to have accepted it, you know, sincerely, the rest just signed it under duress, right? Um, uh, so, which in canon law, by the way, is not valid, right? If, if someone does something under duress, it's not canonically valid. That includes marriage, by the way. Um, if someone is discovered as having entered into a marriage uh, under duress, um, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not valid because you can only enter into any sacrament voluntarily, right? Um, if I, that includes I can't just force, I can't, it's not a real baptism if I take a baby and shove it in the water without anyone's consent, or if I were to take you, Vince, and just like say, baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, that wouldn't be a valid baptism unless you actually consent to it, right? Um, uh, and even if I did, if you consented when I have, again, shotgun to your head, that's not actual <laughs> consent according to canon law, that's duress. Um, anywho, so, Importantly, this is kind of the end of the story of the Great Schism because with the the Council of Florence or the after effects of that, right, um, where it becomes clear to the Orthodox side that the Latin Church is not actually interested in a, a real reunion; they're interested in 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 simply forcing the papal authority over the over the Eastern Church. Um, with this, you start to see a real sense from both sides of the schism that they are separate religions, separate religious bodies, um, where you start to actually have people who have to convert from one to the other, like we do today, right? You know, I had to convert to orthodoxy, I'm having grown up Catholic, right? Well, that, you know, this, this, what, this is what kind of starts this reality. Um, you start to see Latin clergy, especially the Jesuits, going into Greece and Russia and proselytizing and trying to convince people to become Catholic. Um, you also see shortly thereafter, right, um, the, the linguistic distinction that develops between Catholic and Orthodox, even though both, as I said at the beginning, both groups claim to be both the Catholic Church with the Orthodox faith, right? But of course we have this common parlance. I'm not suggesting you go around saying I'm Catholic. 
that would confuse everyone, even though we do believe that. Just like I would never tell, if I were a Catholic priest, I wouldn't tell my faithful to go around and say that they're Orthodox, even though they do believe that, right? Because this linguistic distinction, language is there to communicate things, not, not necessarily to be technically correct. You can be technically correct and communicate nothing, right? Um, so, so that kind of again, brings us to the end of our story. But I, I hope through all of this, I know there's a lot of historical details, but I really wanted to emphasize or make it clear through all of this that the schism, though it ends up becoming a dogmatic point, is all about the authority of the Pope. It's all about the question of, does this one bishop have this ability to, to, to impose his will over the whole church on dogmatic and juridical issues, right? Can he, can he depose and install bishops at will? That's not the ancient model. The ancient model, right, is that every bishop is a bishop equal to one another. And yes, there are first among equals. Metropolitan Tikhon is the first among equals. He could theoretically get the synod together and depose Archbishop Melchizedek if he were acting amiss, right? But other than that, Archbishop Melchizedek is equal to all the other ones. Our Archbishop Tikhon can't come in to our diocese and say Father John is, is, is deposed. He can't come into our diocese and kick out Metropolitan uh, Archbishop Melchizedek. Again, he could call the synod together if Archbishop Melchizedek is behaving badly. That's his duty as the first among equals, is to preside over when there's a gathering of them. You need one to be the one who's actually the president, the one, in, the one presiding. But being simply presiding doesn't give you the authority necessarily to, to impose your will over every individual. That, that's um, one thing I've never understood about people who are Catholic, like you're, you're just cool with one guy. You can... Yes, well, and we also see after, I mean, really we see progressively from the time of the schism onwards, we see this, I mean, even the Filioque is a, a concrete example of this, where for centuries the papacy is opposed to something, and then suddenly you get a pope who accepts it, and it becomes universal throughout the Roman Catholic Church. There's numerous examples, even, you know, where the, the pope opposes something, and then you get one pope who accepts it, and it becomes a new dogma. Thank God that can happen in, in the actual apostolic model of the Episcopacy, right? Because Archbishop Melchizedek could be the, you know, could, I mean, God forbid, but he's our bishop, but he could theoretically fall into the weirdest worst heresy in the world, but thank God that doesn't actually mean that it becomes the church's heresy, right? You know, us priests would get together, we'd write to the synod, we'd say, you gotta do something about this, they would depose him, right? Um, and even if Metropolitan Tikhon, the head of the synod, were to fall into heresy, right? And start to try to promulgate and teach heresy, the rest of the synod would come together, and if he's not willing to, to cooperate, the second, the, the senior most bishop in terms of number of years of being a bishop presides in place of the metropolitan because he's, you know, in, essentially in, in uh, you know, in, in, I don't want to say in, um, he's the one we're, 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 we're concerned with, right? So the thing is, is that you, it's very hard in the apostolic model for, for any heretical teaching to become the teaching of the church because it's an individual who might embrace it or even a group of bishops, but the church as a whole responds by holding a council and, and, and condemning and, and clarifying what the church teaches against this heresy versus the papal model. If the Pope embraces this heresy, it becomes the teaching of the church. And so you progressively get, you know, move along. Yeah, there's no check to his authority. Yeah, well, there isn't a check. I mean, um, I, one of my favorite memes ever is, um, you, know, in, you know, Star Wars Episode Three when the, the Jedi come to arrest Palpatine and he says, I am the Senate. Yeah. It's Pope Francis and he says, I am tradition, right? Yeah. And this thing is, he is actually the arbiter of tradition. So you can't even, you can't even say, well, you know, the fathers say this, and, and all the earlier councils say this, because he says, well, I am the arbiter of tradition. So he's infallible. He's infallible, right? Well, that's, that's later, but yeah. you know. Um, so this is the issue. It's really, the question is not so much the filioque as such. People will say, what causes the schism? People say the filioque. Okay, that's sort of true, but it's the Pope's claim to the authority to not only change the creed at his own will, but then eventually dogmatize the whole thing. But again, this takes time. There's a story involved. I know the politics probably were really boring and tedious to listen to, but my goal was to kind of reveal through this that the primary issue is not the filioque and the dogma surrounding it. That is the, I guess, consequence of it or the occasioning issue. The real issue that causes the schism is papal authority. And today that is remains the issue, right? Um, theoretically, I think there are plenty of Orthodox who would love to see reunion with, with, with Rome. But we'd only be willing to see that if it's on the terms of the apostolic teachings and practices of the church. Meaning, 
the Pope is the first among equals in the West over, over his clergy, but he has no supreme authority over his clergy, let alone any of us, any of our you know, bishops and local churches, right? Um, likewise, we would, we would need to see certain things repudiated. I mean, we, we do find the filioque to be heretical. That have to be repudiated. We find purgatory to be uh, problematic. That have to be repudiated. And I, just, I don't see that happening, right? I mean, the sad reality, I, I would love to see reuni reunification. It'd be good, but... but be realistic. It, yeah, be, let's be realistic. I mean, the, the only groups, and we didn't get into this too much last time, the only groups that we theoretically could see a reunion with is... Um, are the, the non-Chalcedonians and the and the, the Syrian church. Because um, both of them, though they do reject the teachings of the Orthodox Church, there's at least possibilities of finding compromise where they accept the councils and um, there's, there's actual active dialogue in that direction, but they've never abandoned the apostolic model of church governance, right? They, like, they still follow the same model. They never, the papacy is the issue because the papal model becomes mutually exclusive with the apostolic model, right? And so the two can't really fit together and that becomes the problem. And so how do you reunify if their understanding of reunion means submitting to the Pope, which isn't gonna happen. And that's, that's why all the other four patriarchates eventually schism. It took you know, 200 years, but that's why you see the schism where all four of the patriarchs condemn the Roman Catholic Church as having left the apostolic faith, having left the Orthodox faith, having left having split from the Catholic Church. So that's what we still see ourselves as the one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. But for common parlance, you know, to make ourselves understood, communicated, we will call the Roman Catholics Roman Catholics. I'm not telling any of you to go around and tell Roman Catholics, well, you're not actually Catholic according to our teaching. Well, that might be true, but like, A, that's just kind of being a jerk, and two, you're not communicating anything. You have to use the language people say. Like, um, whether you think, you know, Absurd. Like, whether you think Biden's legitimate president or not, he's the president in common parlance. You just, it, it just, it just, it just is what it is, right? You know, but let's actually use language for its purpose, which is to communicate ideas and not, not be stubborn and difficult, right? Uh, pedantic. There we go, right? I mean, that's, and we see actually most the heretics are heretics because they're being pedantic with language rather than just accepting. It is, it is, it is. So, um, any any questions before we break? Or is this a lot of a lot of dates that are.